Exceptionally large user stories are known as epics. Whether the user story is considered an epic or just too large for a single release or sprint, you need to break it down into multiple smaller user stories. The process is called user story splitting or user story slicing. You can split stories while you're grooming, or also known as maintaining, by the way, the backlog. At the latest, you need to split the story to a size that allows the Agile team to estimate the effort required before release planning. Now, most stories need to be further broken down to enable reliable sprint planning. The desired size depends entirely on factors like, well, the Agile team's experience, the size, the velocity, as well as the iteration length. Ideally, user stories are sized so that the team can complete about 5 to 10 during an iteration. If your user stories are larger than that, split them into smaller parts. User story splitting is a critical skill for every member of the Agile team, and it's valuable for representatives of the business community as well. It's especially important for the ITBA. To be effective, story splitting should be a collaborative effort. Everyone needs to work together on intelligent splitting. There are many ways to split a story, and which one you pick depends entirely on your situation. The goal of each presented technique is to right-size the user story to find the quickest path for delivering value to the business community. Here's a quick sample of some of the splitting techniques. Sometimes a complex story hides a simple user story that would provide significant business value if it could be delivered in a single release. If you break this simple story out, the complex aspects of the story could be added in later iterations or releases. Exposing complexities in user stories and epics is often called a vertical breakdown of the user story. Vertical breakdowns are the preferred method in Lean and Agile for splitting user stories to expedite the delivery of business value. A horizontal breakdown splits a story by developer tasks and may not deliver the value to the end user. Developers use horizontal splitting for technical user stories. For example, oh, to define the architectural layers of a system, like the databases, the network, security, user experiences, and so on. Business rules can be a great splitting method. Implementing business rules can be tricky, especially when there are multiple rules for a specific situation that may be in conflict. Implementing a user story that enforces all rules correctly could be huge. Consider starting with the simple rules and enhance the app to enforce complex rules later on. Splitting a user story or epic by steps in a workflow is a common method, but it can be really hard to split them well. Making each step of a workflow a user story is not desirable unless the step provides value to the end user. To split a user story based on workflow, you need to find the fewest number of workflow steps that create a business value. For simple workflows, a technique known as the sequence of events is enough. For more complex epics or workflows, you need to develop a more detailed workflow diagram. Sometimes the complexity in a user story is caused by the variety of data types that are involved. These types of data variations are prevalent in a lot of situations. If that causes the user story to become undoable in a single sprint, split it to enable the Agile team to deliver a simple version and then enhance it to include the outliers. When data transformation is an important aspect of a user story, a data flow diagram fragment often reveals simpler approaches to delivering the business value. If you're familiar with uh, use cases, you might break down a user story by splitting it along use case paths. Each path through the user story makes a great standalone story. Of course, these are just a small sample of the ways that you might need to split a user story to achieve that golden goal of right-sizing the user story for your development team. In order to prove, once the solution is delivered, that the user story was correctly implemented, you need to consider its testability. Remember, a user story is not a requirement as we understood it in Waterfall or, or even requirements engineering. A user story is a trigger for a conversation between someone representing a stakeholder, or you know, whether it's a user or other stakeholder, and a developer. It's not a specification. In Lean and Agile development, user stories 
require acceptance criteria, something also known as conditions of satisfaction. Those define functional, non-functional, and informational requirements that the story has to fulfill to be accepted by stakeholders. They're written from the business perspective to define how to test whether a user story is implemented and functions correctly. Acceptance criteria can be written in natural language like English or whatever else, in numbered lists, tables, scenarios, or other standards chosen by your organization. Although acceptance criteria are great for end-user acceptance testing, they're not at a level of detail that satisfies the needs of developers. Developers need specific examples and scenarios to test individual building blocks of the evolving digital solution as these are created. To that end, a new testing paradigm has emerged. It's also amazingly effective for lean or agile and for traditional approaches to software development. ATDD, Acceptance Test Driven Development, also known as BDD or uh, Behavior Driven Development, represent a significant change in thinking. They require the development of acceptance test scenarios before developers write a line of code for the application. Examples and scenarios are the actual requirements for the developer's point of view. ATD and BDD require the business or customer side team and the technical team to collaborate on developing acceptance tests. Collaboration in creating these tests is critical to ensure that all the different aspects and perspectives are covered. These joint discussions often take place during a three amigo conversation. The participants represent the three different and equal critical perspectives. The customers, which typically is supported by ITBAs, what exactly can we expect? Development, how can we deliver it? And quality assurance, aka testing, does it really work? The outcome of this collaboration are the aforementioned examples and scenarios. The most common method for capturing those is in a new language called Gherkin, which follows a very simple given when then structure. Given this situation, when this event happens, then these outcomes will be achieved. This simple syntax enables all involved parties to document acceptance tests in a language they all understand. That promotes collaboration and mutual understanding of the required tests. As mentioned above, automated acceptance testing is a critical success factor for some of the new software development philosophies. Currently, a lot of teams still have difficulties implementing automated testing, but Lean and Agile teams nevertheless use GWT scenarios to manage their coding work. By drilling down, you've identified functional features, meaning things the software will do, which are functions, and information it needs or creates, which is the data. You still need to explore the other part of solution level requirements, namely non-functional requirements, or NFR. Sometimes these are also called quality requirements or qualities and constraints. Missing and misunderstood NFRs are all too often the cause of project failure. There are a multitude of examples in the annals of IT projects where applications delivered everything they were required to do, but they didn't do them even close to well enough to meet the customer's needs. Anyone who experienced the original rollout of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, in the US can relate to this reality. The website crashed constantly, and when it was available, wait times were often measured in hours. A lesser known problem, by the way, was the German parliamentary election in 1992. A rounding error in a program nearly allowed a political party to be seated in parliament, although they did not receive the requisite number of votes. The law required 5%. But that party only received 4.99%. Now, these are examples of what happens when you don't pay enough attention to the performance dimension. The difference between working software and accurate results can be devastating. NFRs that are relevant to the entire project need to be defined at the beginning of an initiative. NFRs that are unique to a single user story or a single feature should be defined during the iteration in which it gets implemented. Fundamentally, an NFR defines criteria, properties, or conditions that the digital solution must meet before it's acceptable to the business community. Here's a legitimate example of an NFR or quality requirement. 
the nuclear power plant radiation monitor must be available 24-7, 365. It implies that the function can never be allowed to fail. You know, given the gravity of that situation, should it ever fail, this is a pretty reasonable request on the part of the business community, I think. To get you started in defining NFRs from uh, user stories and features, here are four common categories of NFRs. External constraints, performance requirements, user experience requirements, and architectural capabilities. Remember, digital solutions do not exist in a vacuum. There are many external forces that can influence or pose limitations on your product. Each of these are external constraints and we can only give you some general groupings to think about. Ignoring external constraints on any product or initiative is a recipe for disaster, and you should define them as early as possible to avoid wasted work. So some examples of the external constraints include natural limits, things enforced by nature, laws and regulations, which are kind of enforced by external agencies like governments, policies and rules, business rules enforced by the organization, Security, which is about limiting access and protecting data, typically performed by some division of your organization. And a distribution of function and data. All of these are in the performance category. There are constraints to speed and efficiency of the application and the entire business solution. The main problem with performance is not the difficulty in achieving it, but the cost of measuring it. Modern applications can achieve amazing levels of performance if they are necessary and if the business community is willing to pay for them. Frequency is one of the primary performance issues. It's a measure of how often a functional feature will be needed in a given time frame, like per second, per minute, per year, per day, whatever. Urgency is a different dimension of performance. Urgency has two sides. The one most often discussed is called response time. That is the time a person can wait for a response from the application before the person can no longer perform their work. The other side of urgency is called update time, and that is how long can the application wait for input from an external source, whether it's a human being or another application, before the application fails. The volume dimension deals with data. How much data does a function need and how much data does it create each time it is executed? That can be expressed in petabytes, bits, the size of a web page, or whatever measure works for the situation. The number and variety of attributes defining each data element are too numerous to list here. However, I would like to mention one critical NFR that the business uh, community needs to define. The product owner uh, or domain expert or respective data group has to determine the required accuracy of each calculated value. Accuracy includes currency, meaning how quickly does the data in the computer have to reflect reality, and precision, as in how many places behind the decimal point need to be captured. That, by the way, would have avoided that German parliamentary problem. User experience limitations are based purely on the target audience. Who are the folks that are going to interact directly or indirectly with the application? What's their comfort level with the technology? What's their culture, their age, their beliefs? All of these factors influence the design decisions for user interaction. And finally, the architectural capabilities dimension deals with the infrastructure available for the digital solution. Is it going to be in-house equipment, in the cloud, or inconceivable? If available or acquirable technology doesn't support your digital solution, your project will fail. In the end, analysis is still a critical success factor. I'd like to close with this thought. Many of you are probably familiar with a lot of the techniques I mentioned as being essential to lean IT business analysis and agile software development. You may not have heard of some, but I didn't and couldn't mention every technique and, and more are invented every day. If you're interested in learning more about any of the mentioned techniques, check out our Udemy offers that provide training in those. The key takeaway for you, I hope, is that what the BA does will not change drastically as you support more and more lean and agile initiatives. What will change significantly is when you do it and how detailed your analysis needs to be at that time. Fundamentally, solid analysis is a decision-making prerequisite.
that was true in waterfall methodologies, it remains true in lean and agile methodologies. To paraphrase Lewis Carell, uh, Carell, if you don't know where you're going, you can't know how to get where you want to be. Analysis grounds your project in reality. What you need to define is a better future for your organization and all stakeholders. If you're assigned the task of defining requirements by any name, that has always been and always will be your primary responsibility.